Good evening, everyone. And once again, thank you very much for joining us for our uh, academic dialogue in Hargeisa, Africa 40 and 40 webinar series that we are focusing on the impact of the COVID pandemic on all aspects of uh, the human life in Africa. Uh, this will be our fourth episode. So far, we have covered three aspects of it. The first one was on health in general. The second was when we were uh, focusing on the mobility, migration, and internal displacement. And the third, last week, what we had was on humanitarian aid uh, and international cooperation, which all were very effective and interesting, thanks to all the panelists, participants, and people who were following us on live streaming on Facebook. As I say today, we will be covering one of the most important aspects of our life, which is education. And since it's core to all of us, I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion that we are going to have. Uh, the structure is 40-40, where we have the panelists taking 40 minutes. For the night, we have our five panelists who are going to be uh, talking about or uh, leading us into the discussions. So our uh, main speakers for the night are going to be uh, first Dr. Jama Musay Jama, uh, who is an ethnomathematician with a PhD in African studies, specializing in, in computational linguistics in African language. And uh, most of you know him as the director of Hargeisa Cultural Center, who, which is the host of this uh, webinar series. He's also very known for his uh, research on traditional games, which also is uh, tried to be used in the formal education system. Currently, he is also uh, he has also joined as a senior researcher uh, as a re senior research associate position at DPU University College London. So he will be our first uh, speaker. The second speaker for the night is going to be Dr. Yusuf Sheikh Omar, who is a research associate at the School of Oriental Studi Oriental and African Studies in the University of London. He's engaged in many research, but he must uh, must prominently known for his research focusing on African communities, mainly uh, Somali diaspora communities in terms of all aspects of uh, life, but mainly focusing on use, uh, identity, social cultural engagement, peace building and education. So he will be our second main speaker for the night. As a discussant today, we are blessed to have someone coming from the other side of the continent, which we are very grateful to. And this will be Dr. Jerome Tarpes, uh, who is an associate professor of English at the University of Joy, Nigeria. He uh, was an emerging Africa regional coordinator for, uh, for West Africa Innovative Technology, which is highly connected to the alternative uh, system that we are currently trying to use for education. He has served as a Commonwealth of Learning, uh, e-learning cons consultant to the Faculty of Education at the National Open University of Nigeria. He also was a chair for 2017-2018, uh, the expert meetings of Africa Union Commission, which drafted the working document for African virtual and uh, electronic university. And he actually midwived and, and was part of the implementing, has followed it to the implementing level. His, his research passion is covering many things, but mainly into the learning, des uh, de uh, learning designer and uh, teaching with technology. He is actually currently supporting the Nigerian Center for Disease Control as a training consultant on infection prevention and control to strengthen the preparedness capacity of the healthcare system in Nigeria. So we are blessed to have him from both aspects, from the pandemic and also in terms of the aspect of technology, which is the alternative system. As a respondent tonight, we are blessed to have Hamda in Nasser. Hamda Mohammed is an education development scholar, uh, currently doing her PhD as part of a London-based doctoral pathway. Her research interests are in the areas of education, inclusive education, disability, and inclusive development in global South mainly, in line with sustainable development goals. She is also currently teaching in the Department of Development Studies at the a School of Social Science at the University of East London, where she has been a faculty member since 2017. Prior to her PhD, actually, she has been actively engaged in the education development programs, mainly uh, doing a research in the Deb refugee camp and also re research in Djibouti. Uh, the second respondent is Mr. Nasser Mohammed Ali, who is the director of the Institute of Peace and Security, Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of uh, 
Fergus uh, Somaliland. Mr. Ali has master's in international relations and African studies from Addis Ababa University. And he, uh, he is in the final year of his PhD in the University of Peace uh, in Costa Rica. He is engaged in many things, but mainly is known for his teachings, research, and policy analysis in the Horn of Africa. So tonight we will have these all panelists coming together through the moderation of uh, Mona, who is a graduate of USIU African University, and she is a fellow at Oxford University in managing innovative uh, and technology. She is also a trained profession professional on development studies and work with several NGOs in Somaliland, Kenya, and many other places. So these are going to be the leading people who are we communicating. But I also would like to say thank you very much for everyone who's following us on Facebook for our live streaming, and also those people who are joining us on the Zoom platform from all corners of the world who are enriching this conversation through question and answers. So thank you very much once again, everyone. And I'll pass it to you, Mona, for doing the moderation. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening from Hargeisa. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you just for introduction. I'm going straight to the discussion point is. The first discussion point is, uh, how has coronavirus or COVID-19 impact the education system in Africa? Which is the basically mean, what's the impact of pandemic on education system in the continent, as well as the impact worldwide. For instance, the schools, colleges, and universities are temporarily closing. Are people learning from home? Any platform to provide to fill the new education gap? Are there any innovation brought, or generally, what could be the positive and negative impact of COVID-19 on education? Moving on, the second question, how do you see the alternative education platform and their inclusivity, accessibility, and sustainability? Of course, there are some platforms deployed during this pandemic to support people learning from home. These are for different natures, which requires infrastructure, human resource, and material capacity. So, what extent this platform are inclusively and reflective the, particip the participation of all kinds of people? Are this platform, platform is accessible to everybody? What are the percentage of people who have, uh, who have laptops, desktops, smartphones, and above all, internet connections? Do people have the resource they access this alternative platforms. Finally, are these platforms sustainable post COVID-19 pandemic during that time? How can also, how can we still use them after COVID-19? The third question is, what hold this as a future of education in Africa continent? Positive COVID. How will the education system look like post COVID-19 in Africa? What could be some of the major change anticipated ahead? What are the new ways or paths that will be taken? Uh, or what are the new lessons learned, learning from COVID-19 in terms of education system? The last question is how African countries collaborative Groundwork to ensure education rule in Africa. This also basically means how can African countries collaborate to the combine COVID-19 lessons learning and ways forward? And how can we learn from each other to advise our education system? And how can we ensure the role of education in escaping from such pandemic in future? Well, now. I'm going to the offer to the first speaker, Dr. Chama, Mr. Chama. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mona, and uh, thank you to everyone who is joining us. Um, the question is that you have posted uh, on the 
time uh, that uh, the uh, organizers are assigning to us uh, a little bit incompatible, so I will be straightforward to the points of the discussion that uh, I prepared, and hopefully it will match uh, uh, the questions that uh, you are Muna, asking. Uh, so, uh, definitely the pandemic has impacted all aspects uh, of the life and has demanded the world to go to the lockdown, just to start with. Uh, and, um, but with different arrangements in different locations. Um, the fact is that uh, we are living in different places uh, of the world, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, forces us that uh, uh, a system, a university system will not be able to, to cover. For example, uh, we start with the um, minimum uh, uh, washing hands frequently or social distancing or stay home. Some of them are applicable to every place, but some are not. Uh, the entire society that, uh, including the Somaliland one, that probably staying at home uh, doesn't make much sense. People don't stay at home and lock down uh, dying for Hungary because of their livelihood dependence in the morning going outside. Uh, so that doesn't uh, work. People will not be locked down at home in, in, in other places like in other places. So we have to reflect and start from that. Uh, uh, yes, schools were closed physically, but the, the life was not closed, it was not locked down as it happened in other countries. And this is uh, uh, true in many places in, 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 in Africa, but in particular in the Horn of Africa, the East Africa, and in particular in Somaliland. I want to, we will be using the, 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 the word social distancing, which uh, uh, I, I difficultly honestly comprehend. Uh, I mean, I'm, I was using because of everyone is using, but uh, maybe you will, may, uh, you will hear me using physical distancing instead of social distancing. Um, that's the global scenario of uh, well, what's happening in this part of the world, in Africa in general, and in particular in East Africa, and what's happening on, 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 on education. What I will uh, go to uh, quickly is uh, to talk about some, uh, 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 say, numbers, uh, just to understand uh, what we are talking about in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, 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 population that we are we are talking about. So I will mention uh, some numbers. Take an example in Somaliland. Uh, then I will quickly run on the problems uh, and list uh, some of the problems that are common for the entire continent uh, and probably universal. And then I will touch uh, peculiarities uh, for Somaliland and what's happening in Somaliland in particular, so we can understand the problem more closely. I will then. Uh, see the problem is uh, but also focus if there are opportunities i want to look at this challenge uh, if we can learn from something from it uh, and if there are opportunities new opportunities uh, so i will be a little bit more positive uh, as i was in this series of uh, coronavirus impact i was also negative in this uh, uh, tonight i will be uh, uh, trying to look at the positive side and what we can what we can learn. i will finally conclude with some recommendations uh, and, and sort of uh, lessons uh, learned I will touch also, uh, in my view, what impact uh, it has on SDG, system, uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals number four on the education and see how probably this is not uh, impacting negatively, but uh, it may be positive in my view. So I will come back at the last point on that. Now, problem of uh, problem is to close uh, of the closure. First of all, uh, in Somaliland, in 19, from 19 March, the schools are closed physically, schools, universities, and any institution that they are closed. What that does mean? Um, of course, it means it's the interruption of the education as the normally we used to have education and we used to, we used to deliver. And uh, bear in mind that this is also at the end of the semester. So we were having also examinations at the first week of June. So it was more harmful if you want uh, the way that uh, the schools were interrupted. Uh, 
there was uh, the reason and, and another problematic is how to mitigate and minimize the impact on the education. So try to find alternative way to still deliver uh, the education, but also, and most importantly, acting on the spirit on the disease. So the reason what the, of the closure was coming on that. Then we, another problem that we have to look at it uh, and we have still have it is to see as a long-term solution because of this was immediate, something that immediately came out uh, and that's where lessons learned are coming from if there is a solution, a uh, uh, long-term solution that we have to talk about. Then um, any plans uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, when we are coming back to the schools? In fact, uh, yesterday in Somaliland uh, announced that uh, all the closures are not anymore valid, so the schools will reopen. Of course, we are in the holidays for schools in the summer, but the universities will open by the end of the month. What we have planned to, to in the reopening, uh, in the new normal, the world uh, uh, change it and it will change it because of the coronavirus. Uh, so what are the expectations that we have in the in the in the in, in reopening? Of course, uh, the first uh, uh, alternative way of delivering classes that were coming was the use of internet. Uh, another problem, internet uh, can be considered uh, an alternative to everyone. If everyone has a computer, how many families that can have uh, that uh, the, the connection of internet who can pay uh, the, uh, the connection, I know that, in, for example, in Somaliland, uh, it is uh, one of the countries that has technologically advanced when it comes to the connection to the internet, uh, but it is costly. So how families can cope with the additional cost is, is another important, important. Another uh, peculiarity is that Somaliland immediately applied and many other is followed afterwards is the radio transmission. We are in our own society. Radio is, uh, has been always part of our life uh, and still the listening methodology is uh, important for this world society, but Somaliland people in particular. So uh, immediately we started, Somaliland started to deliver some classes in the morning from eight up to 12 in the morning classes. But uh, again, how far the radio on Radio Hargeza, the single state only state run uh, uh, radio that we have in Somaliland, how much, how can cover for the entire country? That was another question, but it was really, really important thing that uh, classes went immediately to the, to, the, to the radio. Again, teachers, teachers, how they could, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 go with the new system, go in, in front of the telecamera or going into microphone is something is not so easy. So the teachers, we cannot uh, immediately think that uh, a teacher who used it to teach uh, in front of the class can go to the radio or the television in front of the telecamera and with the anxiety that you can imagine can deliver the lesson. So it can also start uh, impact. Uh, so teacher preparations was not ready. Uh, that was something that we were not expecting. So what something we'll have to do also in the future. As I was saying, we are an oral society and we may take advantage of the radio. And uh, uh, it has that challenge of uh, radio coverage for the entire country and the, and, the, and the preparation of the teachers. But the interesting aspect is that uh, this population, we have 60% of the population in the nomadic area that probably had no access at all education initially. Now they have in less or more, but they have new. So although we were targeting probably to the villages uh, and to the small cities uh, in order to deliver the, 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 the education through the radio, today the nomadic uh, young boy in, with the camels, uh, with those uh, small, uh, uh, how I can say that uh, the cheap telephone is ha can have the classes and it's happening in Somaliland. So positive things that, that came out that we have to take advantage. And that's what I mean, for example, SDGs, uh, how we can reach and the so-called no one left behind. Uh, it's a way that we can reach through the radio and through uh, the 2G signal of the telecommunication and education can reach out to so something that uh, we were not ready, we did learn because there was a problem and we have to take advantage and, and, and use for the future. I know that my time is, 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 is going to end, but another point that I will touch is the, uh, the sort of uh, uh, parents who were part of the education system now. At the school, when the, the radio or, or the TV 
the, there was a chance when, what, when it is possible, honestly, because of we know the income, the low income of families have not that opportunity to have uh, sitting with the children and flow in the classes uh, through the radio. But still, when there was an opportunity, there was a way of uh, parents who were close more than what the students were, were, were from. Uh, one of the things that we have to deal with, uh, and I'm going to the uh, um, to my uh, to the conclusion is uh, first of all the NGO mentality that we are expecting someone who support uh, that the, for this kind of crisis should be unlearned. That should be the first lessons that we have to unlearn because of uh, uh, when the crisis come, you will count of what you have. You know the the, the concept of of uh, uh, you know state uh, that was. Uh, to, to count on only with it is uh, on the resources uh, is proved it uh, is the way to go. So we have to uh, not expect something that's coming from outside or the aid that can help us in this kind of in this kind of emergencies. So what we have the kind of education. So we have to look the peculiarities, uh, and that's why I was underlining the issue of the radio, but also the issue of the orality, and see how we can take advantage of of those. So the the, the, the mentality that means support from the external should not be counted uh, for, can, for this kind of emergencies. And because of the crisis, uh, you know, arise immediately. It doesn't inform you. There is no, you know, uh, uh, sort of a notice beforehand. Uh, so you have to deal with one, one, one would come. And this is valid for whole Africa, but in particular in, 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 in Somalia. We are coming back, uh, as I was saying, as the nation state mentality and framework where the nation state people can count of their own resources in every aspect. That includes the human resources. So that's where I coming from too. Uh, and and to, the, to the education system, we have to see how we can train our teachers in that kind of emergencies because of we will not have time to get aid coming from uh, outside possible. So the new technology, if the new technology is the way to act and it should be because if we have to deal with the new normal and we have to go to that direction of the uh, of the of the of the of of, of, uh, of as a solution, we have to be prepared in Africa, but we have to find a, a way to cost effective available technology to everyone. This is a crucial and fundamental. We shouldn't count that everyone will have a computer at their home, but we have to think that uh, probably every nomad uh, man or woman has a cheap mobile phone with the, uh, two, two, only two cheap access uh, or to see how we can deliver through radio signal, through the, uh, the, the 2G signal, so we can reach, reach out. So technology, cost-effective, available at the moment. Of course, we will think in the future, but what is available available today? It, uh, we, we might think of uh, uh, sort of uh, offline solar-powered uh, tablets, for example, because if we know the electricity, how big is important. If we say, let us go for the internet and know that uh, the technology that we have uh, needs electricity, but the, the mature, the, the great part of the country, there is no electricity. It doesn't make sense that we count on internet. We have to count on the, if it's, uh, we, the lesson is learned, uh, we have to develop and find a way to get uh, a cheap devices, uh, solar system based, uh, and then use what we have, which are the, 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 the 2G mobile phones. Uh, so lessons learned, and what uh, can go can be a suggestion is coming suggestion coming to uh, from this uh, uh, crisis, uh, but we can immediately develop in our schools. For instance, uh, uh, and and this is in the case of selfishly speaking in Somaliland, uh, uh, we have only one one radio state uh, managed radio. So thinking about to have private radio and developing radios and working uh, for a long time that we were waiting, it would be extremely fundamental. Radio became extremely helpful. So we have to take advantage and go with it uh, and go and and, 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 and and develop. We can work. And I think this was uh, from time to time was coming back uh, radio classes in the normal teachings. Uh, I remember when I was young, uh, when I was a kid uh, in our schools, we have a small radio, but it was a testing. I think it can be developed now and go back that the radio become part of the school curriculum and school radio, radio community radios, uh, they might come up and be part of our uh, education system, formal 
and, and informal. We, uh, in that way, we will be reaching out to people we were uh, failing to reach out to before, which is 60% of our population who are in the nomadic area. One last thing then, Mona, I will conclude, so I will take one more minute than, uh, than my time allocated. Uh, so when we are talking about the crisis, uh, the crisis is not only a healthcare issue. It's not only in our case, academic and educational crisis. It is also a livelihood crisis. So when we are talking about education system, and that's what I would love that uh, our questions and answers and our uh, other panelists should focus uh, as well, is that uh, the closure of the schools uh, took the life, if you want, uh, of entire system of people who were connected to the education system. Think about all the teachers. Well, the state-owned uh, uh, schools, uh, teachers are still paid, but the private teachers today are not paid, for example. All the informal and chronic uh, uh, madras and, uh, and have no, the teachers has no any income at all, so they are jobless. But think about it also the drivers of the buses of the schools. There are entire uh, informal economy based on the around the education system, which today are affected by the by, by the coronavirus. Finally, and not but not the least, is uh, for example the women who had the small tea shops in the schools. It was entire economic system that collapsed with the closure of the schools. So we, we should think about them when we are talking about the crisis that the education system got from, 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 from coronavirus. And with that, I conclude. And with one more minute that I took, I give you back the microphone, Mona. Thank you so much. Mona, we can't hear you, Mona. Mike, uh, un please unmute Mike for Mona. Hello? Yes, yes. You can, can you hear you me now. right now? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chama. And um, I would like to welcome right now, Dr. Yusuf Shekhomar. He is your uh, next speaker. So welcome. Thank you. The Thank you, Mina. Okay, salam alaikum, everyone. So, Mina, what's the time timeline for each speaker? Uh, 10 minutes, please. 10 minutes, okay, great. So, yes. I would like just to summarize it. Anyway, I think I did already, uh, you know, send, I did already Mataqana send the summary of my of my paper, but I would like just to talk about the dot points and Hamda as an uh, educationalist in London, if I do some mistake, but please correct me. Uh, I'm not that mad, you know, aware in the education system in, in UK coming from, from Australia, but I have been just for a few years. That's quite enough to understand an education system in the UK. Uh, I have written an article uh, that was entitled Why is the Somali diaspora so badly hit by COVID-19? And Dr. Jama knows that, and it became so very controversial uh, in an article in the, in the Somali, you know, studies, uh, research, you know, network <laughs> was absolutely very controversial. And from that inspiration, I, I just wanted to, you know, as a passion really to, to, to write another, you know, piece about the Somali uh, community, you know, education and the COVID, you know, 19. So uh, a recent publication about COVID-19 did say, uh, while children from disadvantaged communities will likely need the most help at this time, they are the least likely to have access to the help and you know, resources needed. School, school closures due to the COVID-19 are likely to widen the disadvantage gap. So just so you can understand, it's quite very much, you know, summary of the, uh, of the you know, educational gap uh, caused by the COVID-19. I don't like to talk about the community profile in London, but it's quite very diverse and very complicated community. It goes back to the Seaman era, late 19, you know, you know in the 19th century uh, until, you know, 18th, yeah, yeah, sorry, 20th century. Uh, and then after the civil, sorry, uh, World War II, 
mostly Somali community in East London, I think goes back to that time. And then the, the dictatorship era, Siad Berre and uh, early 1980s, until the collapse of the 1991. The Somali community in my understanding and in my humble investigation has been at the bottom of education in UK. Even, uh, you know, less educated than the, the Bangladesh you know, community. However, there have been a lot of improvements and, you know, for the last few years, uh, thanks to the you know, young Somali parents who grew up in the West and started here, and now becoming a major you know, uh, parents, maybe in the future, in the Somali community who understand how to help the children in the education system in the UK. That's one point of the educational improvement. Uh, the second point is the community tuition centers also did contribute a lot, really contribute a lot. Uh, thirdly, uh, there have been uh, a general you know, investment in the education sector in the community as well, in many ways. Uh, the community has become quite mature enough to understand the benefit of education and how to invest. Even those less educated you know, parents actually manage it to some extent to, to help their children in different ways. So what are the main challenges caused by the COVID-19? One of them is the housing that, you know, in every Somali problem in the, in the diaspora, housing is the number one. So unexpectedly housing uh, have become schools and the workplace. And Somali parents, we, uh, uh, who many of them are less educated, you know, uh, saw themselves as, as a teachers at the same time. Uh, there was a study conducted uh, on Somali boys, two, 12 Somali boys of year seven in 2018 in central London. And the, these 12 boys actually complained about lack of, you know, space and positive environment to, you know, to study. And at that time, they had a lot of alternatives as well, you know, the libraries, they were free to go everywhere they like. So you can imagine, uh, you know, the challenge when the, the homes become, uh, you know, schools and everyone is uh, prison, you know, at, uh, you know, at home. Senior, you know, uh, siblings are working at home. For instance, myself, I, I work at home, you know, all the time, and uh, but I don't have a lot of children. But uh, we have a wonderful communities with a lot of children, you know, ten. Uh, in which maybe at some point, you know, three or four of them can share. So you can understand, you know, the challenge, you know, posed by the COVID-19 uh, in terms of space-wise or spatial or, you know, the, the house-wise. Uh, many studies uh, did indicate that, you know, children or students who live in a positive environment do read a lot compared to others who do not have a positive environment. Maybe a uh, uh, time difference of four hours per day. So you can understand uh, four hours per day of you know, difference, you know, the impact of that you know, time of you know, educational investment. Uh, and then I need to move to the, uh, to the neighborhood. Uh, the neighborhood is another issue. It can you know, impact our education system in many ways. And most of Somali ways in the diaspora are placed in very poor and disadvantaged areas. It's not our fault, uh, but anyways, that's our reality. Uh, so the neighborhoods, the reason study did indicate that 50% of teachers in uh, affluent schools, in public schools, in affluent areas, return their homework, 75% of them of their actually students returned homework compared only to 37% of public school student, uh, sorry, of teachers uh, in, in, in the poorer area uh, said that their you know, students did actually return the home, homework. So you can see, you know, the, the, the impact of the, of the neighborhood uh, and the educational you know, uh, achievement, that's a really big, big difference. 
the study that I mentioned recently uh, on the 12 Somali boys also uh, said uh, the Somali boys, 12 Somali boys did show poor life routines in their lives at home and generally in the community wise. We need to be honest when we're talking about communities. We have wonderful communities in a Somali community in diaspora, but to some extent, our life is not well planned. And that goes back to the culture, you know, the nomadic culture in a sense. And, and the older generation, maybe young parents are quite different and quite well educated, you know, people who integrated uh, well also quite uh, could be, you know, uh, different. So these 12 Somali boys uh, also, uh, the conclusion was they had very poor, you know, life plan and routine in their lives. And I spoke with a few Somali parents uh, here in London, and a few of them actually told me, you know, they have some difficulties in, you know, managing their children at home. And particularly boys, they, they go to bed maybe 2 to 3 a.m. in the morning all the time, you know, the whole night just see they are online and really you know we don't know what they are doing basically and most of our parents do not have the skills how to actually understand and manage yeah so that's the life you know plan uh the other point is you know the parents uh, themselves as well as i said we have quite young parents who are quite well educated but at the same time we have a less educated parents middle-aged parents and all the generation parents are quite less educated uh so but in a sense generally somali parents have high ex high you know expectations of their uh children's educational achievement yeah, globally as well but they do not know how to materialize that into reality that's quite uh, a bit challenging because of the educational limitation or limited limited uh, education uh many of them uh, have little or no technical know-how or technological understanding at all and then they suddenly saw themselves as a teacher, you know, online teachers at home, and they don't have. It's a profession that well-trained actually teachers at universities and high schools also are just struggling and saying, we can't take up that. We need training, we need time, we need space. Plus, there are a lot of information sent by schools, you know, applauded information requesting Somali parents, many of them are less educated to handle and to teach their children. So that's another big, big issue, uh, a big issue. I spoke with a, a mother in my local area and she said, uh, and she said, you know, the boys are on the internet and playing games all the time. And, uh, and I don't know what are they doing and but they tell me they are starting. So if you don't understand, you know, the computer and the online, they can pretend and they say we are starting and you can't really stop them as long as they say we are you know starting uh lack of learning culture in the somali house in the somali families that's a big issue it's a it's, it's a killing the culture in many ways uh, anthony gooden is a well-known sociologist you know internationally known he said there is inequality at home he said there is some sort of equality at school like i'm based in south hall when my you know, local you know, uh, parent is sending their children to the same school, teachers in a sense are fair and just they teach them equally. But the difference is the house they're coming from, you know, the level of parents' education, educational facilities, parents' involvement, that can make a huge difference. We are so disadvantaged in that sense. A few years back, I. I, I, I spoke with uh, uh, Saeed Salah, he's a well respected Somali educationalist based in Minneapolis. And he told me uh, uh, at the schools he worked, populated with, uh, with Somalis, he said two thirds of Somali children in his you know, schools did not have anything to read at home rather than Mishaf or uh, in a version of the Quran. Two thirds is a big number. He actually requested them to go home and just to account how many books they have at home. And two third, that means two in every three, they didn't have anything to read at home. 
The reality is we do not have a learning culture. And that can impact it positively. When we have a learning culture at home can you know impact positively. So I mean, I say, you know, our houses have become schools, but schools without educational learning, without a learning culture, without you know uh, libraries, without books, without uh, you know a positive environment to study. Again, I can't generalize. You know, some parents are really to, uh, trying, but the real, really, I can understand as a Somali who lived in Australia and now living in in UK and quite very much inside them. That's a quite some, you know, uh, uh, you know, some, you know, a difficult start in our, in you know, in, in the Somali culture. So we really need to change that. Culturally, we have that kind of understanding. We need to help our children physically and send them to school, prepare them, provide them, you know, books, maybe food and uniform, but not uh, to get involved, you know, directly in teaching at home. But now we are teachers. So what we do when we compare with Asian parents, you actually have been teaching and actively involved prior COVID-19. So the Asian parents actually, when they become now, when they become teachers, they it's a kind of continuation that kind of job they has been doing even before the COVID-19. But for us, it's something new. It's a shock. Socioeconomic. It's also another factor. Uh, it's so common. It, it doesn't require a lot of explanation. When you have some sort of good income, you have many, you know, alternatives to, you know, to hire, you know, private tutors and to provide educational requirement as well. Positive, you know, environment where they can study all this stuff. But we coming from low income earners community. So in that sense, you know, the, the, the low income has become, uh, uh, you know, a factor, negative factor in the era of the COVID-19. Uh, and finally, not finally, sorry, uh, the annual loss of the learning uh, for the uh, students from disadvantaged communities. Another study did find that disadvantaged communities you know, have already, I'm talking previous research, indicated, you know, they, they showed some sort of loss of learning during the holidays. But affluent parents and communities, or maybe rich parents, can provide some sort of alternative education, maybe holiday education, excursion, some purposeful, you know, uh, uh, planned, you know, educational projects that can, you know, enhance their education. But for us, we just to keep them at home on the, the holiday, you know, and this without any educational improvement. And then teachers actually did observe when they come back from the holiday, the gap has widened. And now we're talking uh, absence from school of six months, starting from 23rd of, 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 of March until September. Most students will be away from school, maybe some primary school, not primary school, could year one. A reception and maybe year six, only year 10 and year, uh, you know, uh, 12. And also it's all optional. You know, my daughter, go, my, my daughter, she's year one, unless then 20% actually are coming to the, you know, to the school of year one. So that means six months will be out of, of teaching. So I'm expecting a huge, huge educational inequality created by uh, the COVID-19. Uh, so now, I don't like to be negative all the time. I need to mention some positive that we learned from the COVID-19. There's some sort of family reconnection. You know, you know some parents actually uh, had a time really to uh, family met to come together to talk and how to manage their affairs, how to get involved in you know, their children's education. Some parents who have been absent all the time are now quite aware of what their wives are doing in the new job. Uh, sadly, some people are saying that Somali fathers are prisoners and should, they should be treated as a prisoners in a positive way. <laughs> I mean, they are, you know, we, we know our culture. Most Somali men are not at home all the time. They are outside. 
And there was a quotation, a lot of information circulating in social media saying, uh, in the time of war, prisoners should be treated you know, fairly, and so madmen should be treated fairly, they are in prison. <laughs> Yeah, but on the other side, many Somali fathers are not at home in many ways. And that's another point I really didn't mention. Uh, lack of the father figure in our families, particularly from our culture, you know, coming from the collective background. In Somali boys and African boys in general, they need some sort of a figure, a positive male figure, you know, as a, a role model, you know, to imitate and just to see them up. And, I can argue you, I haven't done any statistics, but I can argue you more than 50% of Somali families are run by single mothers. Uh, there's a divorce, there's separation. Many Somali men went back home to Africa for different reasons. And even if they are here, they are absent, but they physically they are here in many ways. So their involvement is very minimal. So I'm just still continue to the positive side. There is some you know, involvement of Somali parents. They are, we are forced really to get involved to the education. So some parents are now realistically trying really to understand and to improve their skills and you know, to help their children in, in one way or another. Uh, there is a, a positive communication uh, somehow uh, better than before between parents and the school. Some, because parents are communicating, all the teachers are you know, calling and pushing and you know, asking them, okay, how's it going? Are they on the right track? You know, the children asking them. So that kind of, you know, push creates some sort of positive, you know, engagement and feeling responsibilities. And the other positive is some parents actually did tell me, you know, many Somali boys are kept at home in a, in a situation they can't actually engage with their peer criminal background uh, to take them to the drug and the crime and the knife crime and all this stuff. So they said some, oh, it's quite a positive. Oh, our, our, our sons are not engaged, you know, with the crimes, with all this stuff. So they feel that kind of, you know, the prison. But it's good. Excuse could me, been, Victor. Yeah, yes. just to finish, almost to finish, one minute. Sorry so for interrupting, but time up. Mental illness. Just say, I will conclude in one minute. All right. I will uh, be one. So the way forward, the suggestion is, uh, I would suggest, you know, Somali, professional in the education sector like Hamda and others to come together and identify those who are at risk and really help them as they can. I would suggest the Somali politicians, we have more than 16 Somali councillors and many people who are active in the politics, as well to engage with the politicians to help in the Somali communities in their electoral areas, in a sense, uh, to set up a specialist team, maybe uh, Victor Jama can consider that, uh, you know, especially in the education sector to, you know, research about the impact of COVID-19, the short term, but the impact in the longer term as well. The impact will be felt in one, two, after two, three years, back, you know, you know, from now on, not really now. Thank you, uh, Muna, for your patience. Thank you. Mona, we can't hear you at all. Mona, you are out. I was unmute, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf. And um, now, thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, now I'm going to do, um, to welcome Hamda Mahmoud. And um, she's the first responder. So welcome, Hamda. Um, thank you very much, Mona. Uh, it's a pleasure to take part in such, I think, a much needed conversation. Um, Dr. Jama and Dr. Yusuf said a lot of things, so I'm going to try and respond to maybe key points. Uh, I think the, I, I'm based on my observations. I think it's important, uh, one of the key observations that Jama shared with us at the beginning was that uh, this kind of global response to COVID-19 um, was not applicable in Somaliland you know, with the measures around social distancing, measures around uh, um, essentially, you know, um, staying at home and the lockdown. And that evidence is to me is that there's a real need to localize any kind of approaches that we have globally in Somaliland. I think it's important um, that we have these discussions about localization and in, particularly if we talk about moving forward and progressing um, in terms of achieving towards the S sustainable development goals. Um, 
another a point that was raised and I want to just add to is this um, essentially this issue around uh, um, access to quality, right? Um, I think, uh, I mean, the ministry has taken two approaches in Somaliland, I've taken two approaches to education. One's been internet-based learning, and then again, there's been a return to radio-based learning. Um, both, they have issues in terms of access. Um, and I think this has indicated, this experience has indicated that we need to either, you know, there are gaps and that these gaps need to be addressed moving forward. Um, but again, I think it's very important that we acknowledge that, you know, there are, there's far more to be learned from the indigenous way of learning. I think the current education system, which is very underpinned by a neoliberal thinking um, and, and has been rapidly marketized and, and you know, uh, I think there needs to be a change. And if, I think a lot of young people in Somalia now are questioning whether or not the current education system is fit for purpose. And I think this is a positive. We're having critical um, kind of engagement or reflection on our current education system. Um, so the broad education system, which is very important. Um, I think moving forward, I think we need to acknowledge the non kind of cognitive learning that happens in education spaces. Um, and I think this is a positive, especially in terms of in Somaliland, you've seen um, a kind of renewed, renewed interest into indigenous forms of learning. You know, you've seen people who have gone back and, and are more engaged into the natural kind of landscape or more appreciative of traditional forms of, uh, of knowledge or traditional forms of medicine. Um, and that's young people. So there has been a kind of a, a generational uh, bridge in terms of how we kind of respond to COVID-19, which is very interesting. And I think we, moving forward, we can capitalize on this kind of um, renewed, renewed interest. Um, I think in line with Leave None Behind, the notion that in order to um, move forward, we need to prioritize those who have been left behind or the most marginalized. I think we really need to consider the needs of children with disabilities and the needs of children that live in, in remote or rural areas, um, especially when we're talking about education and, and how interconnected it is. For example, there are many children who would access feeding programs in schools, um, and that is no longer available, I think, in Somaliland. So I think the Somalian government and education system has to somehow consider ways of delivering that food to these people because, or these, children, these families, because these are their lifelines for, for many cases. Um, so I think in terms of, I think in terms of thinking about sustainable development goal four, about equality, I mean, inc inclusive and equitable education, I think the discussion now has to be looking at localized explorations, how we can localize education. I think that's what the focus needs to go, because I think uh, the, what this experience has demonstrated to us, that there are gaps um, and uh, I guess some tensions in, in our current education system. So I would like to, I would like to move forward um, is to address this and to, to see um, essentially a, a move back to indigenous ways of learning. And yeah, so I think I've summarized that. Uh, I think I have five minutes. So I think I'm going to wrap it up with just saying that, you know, I think there are other forms of learning, like what I've seen in the Somali communities, we're very resilient and we're very uh, in it. I and mean, we have very creative ways of approaching things. So we can capitalize on these skills rather than trying to adopt an education system that does not work for us. Um, and again, that's been evident in our, uh, the approach to COVID-19, which has, hasn't worked. So I think we really need to really consider what really works for this in, in the Somalian context. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much, Hamza Mohammed. Um, right now, I will hand over to, I'm going to the hand over Nasir. Hello, Nasir. Hello? Can you hear me, Nasir? Hello? Hello, Mona. Hello, Salam alaikum, Nasir. Can you hear me, please? Can you hear me? Hello, Mona. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, please? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, please? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Can you hear me, please? Yeah, yeah, thank you. 
I have a common problem, so just I will summarize the, the collection from the two presenters. So what we are discussing now is in one community in two different contexts. So what I observe from these two presentations is three points. Knowledge gap between the children and the parents. That's, that's one very important which we observe from the corona. So there is a gap between the parents, knowledge gap between the parents and the children. The other very important factor is socioeconomic factor. The third point is family reestablishment, family relations reestablishment. So I will link the presentation of Dr. Yusuf to the presentation of Dr. Jama Musa. So let me put uh, these two presentations in a quick uh, reflection. So when we are talking about the impact of coronavirus in Somaliland or in the region, we have both positive and negative impact of the corona. So if I try to summarize the positive impact of the corona for us, I can say at least two, three different factors. Number one, the corona virus has led us to introduce a technology-based lectures. So now we are using to deliver the courses, the, the uh, classes from KG to primary, secondary technology. That's what the other very important point to mention, meaning that education is delivering policies, development profession, not only in Somalia. Another very point to note is that mostly staying at home to help technology. This has reestablished. I want to emphasize the point of Dr. Yusuf. This even at home, this kind of state. Nasir. Hello, Nasir. At home, reestablish the child parent relationship as the parents are busy with helping their children. Just the uh, impact of the corona time. And, and the child at all levels is to use the child. So that's another very important point. Radio transmission and also the TVs is also another very important. If I try to see the negative impact of the corona, it discovered the social disparity because the, the society, they are not equal when it comes to the economy and uh, all these. So we have access to computer or smartphone reality and it still it remains a critical factor. So that's a challenge because what we are saying, we are going to deliver the courses online in, via computers and smartphones. That will be a challenge since the society are not equal when it comes to the socioeconomic level. Another, can you hear me please? Yes, yeah, yeah. we can hear you, yes, continue. Another very important point is also to mention delivering courses online is another challenge, both the students and also the teachers, including the universities, not only the KGs, primary schools, but also at the universities there's a challenge. For example, some of the teachers at the universities are not familiar with using or how to use the computer. So that's also another challenge. So that has forced the universities to prepare extra facilities to help the professors or the, or, or the lecturers. Another very important point is families, the families, mostly they are dependent on the schools economically. So when the 
school is and the universities were closed. The families, those who were economically dependent on the universities and schools, also they faced economic challenges. So these are the key areas which I can mention and summarize. But the very important point to mention is that the Somali society, whether they are living at home or they are in the diaspora, they are failing, facing similar challenges. So these are the three key areas which I summarized it. Uh, for example, a knowledge gap between the children and parties, socioeconomic factor, and also families relationship, which is not very strong. So that's the key area which I can summarize. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nasa. Can you hear me, please? Um, yes, yes, we Hello? can. Can Hello? you hear me? Please? Yes, we can. My, my internet is not stable. That... No, thank you so much. We can hear you. Thank you, Nasa. And uh, now I'm going to the welcome and Dr. Jerome for the conclusion. Welcome to the platform. Thank you, you very much, very, very clearly. Yeah, very clearly. So yes, thank you very much uh, for moderating. Thank you, Dr. Jamal. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf. And um, thank you, those of you who intervened. Let me start with a proverb. It's an African proverb. I hope it is known also in Somaliland. In Nigeria, we have a proverb that the king's palace that got burnt is asking for more beauty. If people have uh, leaders, traditional leaders that have palaces, you will understand. Palaces are very old and therefore are different from modern buildings. And normally they do not just upgrade them. But if they catch fire and burn down, Sure, they will build them the way houses are built uh, contemporary. In other words, COVID-19 may have come as a shock, but it is like the king's palace that got burned. I would look at um, the presentation of Dr. Jama and Dr. Yusuf and the entire topic and say that we have so many positives. I agree with Dr. Jamal when he said that uh, we should look, and I'm using my words, not his, we should look at the low hanging fruits because the small boy who is a nomad in the village does not have a computer, but may have a small telephone, a basic telephone, not a smartphone, from where he can listen to the radio. Yes, we can start from there. Uh, in Nigeria, since COVID-19 began, um, some states have actually initiated radio lessons for primary schools and secondary schools. And private primary and secondary schools are using very cheap technology especially in the urban areas, they are using technology that they do not need to teach anybody how to use, is readily available in the hands of their parents, such as WhatsApp. My own last son, who is 10 years old, has been on this program since the lockdown began, and he is learning. But the bigger questions we must ask ourselves beyond returning to traditional ways of learning, which the two speakers eloquently talked about, the bigger questions we should be asking ourselves is if we have our children in the former ways of learning, how do we adapt so that these alternative ways of learning can lead not just to formative and so on knowledge, but also to summative knowledge in a focused and systematic way so people can move from one grade to another, given that we do not know how long COVID-19 will last and how long this situation will last. 
it's a bigger question that we should be asking ourselves. I do not think that um, the closure of schools is necessarily too bad for us. For too long, for far too long, we have followed the pattern that was imposed on us by the global north. Now that this has been dislocated, it gives us an opportunity to discover multifaceted learning channels that will help us to decolonize education, that will help us to rethink our pedagogy and our teaching and learning approaches such that we will have new perspectives and will hopefully stimulate us to look inwards as Africans and perhaps better align our educational systems to address African issues in our African context and address our own needs and realities. So yes, we may, the spectrum is such that we cannot use one brush and brush the, the everything. In every part of Africa, we have those who can access smartphones, true. We have those who have computers and internet connection, true. We have those who don't have these things, true. So if we take a multifaceted approach that we are forced now to begin to discover, instead of the sitting uh, 8 to 4 or 8 to 2 p.m. in class, then we will do well. I think that in my own part of Africa, in Nigeria, at the primary and secondary school levels, all the way to the rural areas, is not such a big challenge. The big challenge is in higher education. The, it is a challenge because it is, first of all, a political problem. Some of you who may have been watching uh, African news and may have been aware of what is happening in public universities in Nigeria, the lecturers union has been at loggerhead with government for a long time, over funding and over things like that. And because of that, they, they were on strike before COVID-19. Now they have opportunities to use alternative means, including uh, e-learning, but they can't do that. In fact, the national leader of, of the lecturers union said publicly that Nigerian universities cannot do e-learning. That is a political problem. And this political problem highlights also part of what has been hindering the progress of Africa, not just Nigeria, but in other places. In other words, when I looked at the, the summary, the concept note that was provided, note that we were equating using alternative forms as expensive and uh, involving a lot of expensive infrastructure. Yes, that is so. But the examples I've given also show that we can use very low level technology, if technology at all, with high impact. In summary then, I would say that post COVID-19, we would, Niger um, Nigeria and Africa, including Somaliland, would be better off for it. There are a number of things that we were overlooking. Now the reality has hit us. There were other things that we were able to have put our hands to try, but we left it for those who felt it was a convenient pastime. So now, because the King's Palace has caught fire and is burning, we are forced to think the new architecture to use to rebuild a better education for our people. I think I will stop from here. Thank you so much, Romo, for your presentation and completion. Now is the time we start the Q&A. So I can see a lot of questions from the attorneys. So I will start on Anna. Anna, she said, uh, this question goes, by the way, Dr. Chama. Um, thank you, Dr. Chama, for your presentation. I have a question on the use of radio for teaching. How do we provide balance for student evaluation and guards of comprehension? Secondly, she follows other uh, question, which basically meaning 
how to archive and advance to the use of radios for all level of education and what how how could be effectively and sufficient. Thank you, Chang. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, this uh, this important question. Uh, first of all. Um, the fact that uh, this is an emergency, we are dealing with what we have. Uh, so uh, radio um, uh, uh, is, is, a, is a powerful, very powerful uh, tool and method that's available and that is being used. But of course, uh, it has its uh, shortcoming. And, but this kind of shortcoming that you had mentioned, which I completely agree with you, which is the student evaluation and a guidance comprehension is a problem for all uh, remote uh, uh, learning processes. So whether we are using uh, uh, TVs, whether we are using uh, internet based, uh, and whether we are using uh, 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 radio, we will have the same problem. Probably with the internet where we can have a sort of uh, uh, interacting and question answering with the students, it's my, my sort of that problem of evaluation, but for sure uh, it's a generic problem that we have to deal with. Uh, I, I, I was promoting, I still believe about the um, radio because of the widespread uh, uh, accessibility. I agree completely with it, Dr. Sharami, when you are saying we have to use a multifaceted uh, uh, approach. This is a, a one of the approaches that is today available, and and I am I'm concerned about the people who we failed to reach initially, these disabled people, but also. Uh, most importantly, people who are in the remote area, uh, internally displaced people, or those people who we cannot uh, think uh, for them, internet, uh, computer, ta uh, uh, tablets, and so on. So that's the reason why I'm, um, I'm, I'm thinking that the radio is, is important. The second, and then I will conclude because I know there is a lot of questions in the list. Uh, um, the level of education. We are in Somaliland. We started now with the primary and secondary education. I think that's still available for that, and we have to target for that two groups. When it comes to the universities, I feel a little bit complicated, and I am assuming that a student who have access to the university education will have also access in one way or other the internet. So we will use any different. So my suggestion is that we target to reach out also for SDV. G4 to target as uh, uh, much in number as possible for the radio in primary and partially in the secondary education. Thank you. Mona, Mike, can you unmute please your microphone? We are not hearing you. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me right now? Yes. Yeah, yes. I will pick other question. And um, this question goes to Nasir. Nasir, can you hear me? Hello. You can go to the next question if he's not here. All right. Uh, let me here. ask. Um, let me because. Let me ask Dr. Tama again in this question. And uh, this question comes from Yahya, and Yahya he said, are the teachers well equipped technology to lecture? Absolutely not, to make a short the question. So Thank no, it's so not that. And I mentioned it's the reason, so go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. And right now I would like to ask question Hamza Muhammad, which is come from um, um, Abdrahman Musa from Facebook, and he asked us, "What is the best way for the teacher to communicate to communicate uh, to communicate, communicate it with a parent? Which is the best I, way?" Yeah. I think that that question depends on what is available to the parents and the teacher, right? What are the communication channels that are accessible to both? And from my understanding, I believe that's WhatsApp <laughs> across the board, I think, especially in Somaliland. Um, but then again, that's dependent on internet. Um, so again, it's, it depends. I think there isn't a one size fits all approach. Um, I think we need to have like a bottom up approach to it. 
and look at individually at different schools, um, the teachers need to do an assessment to think about what do parents have access to and what communication uh, models. But I think we're a community who are very socially connected. So I think if one person has access to the internet or, you know, there is a way of, we have a social responsibility to, to, to kind of, um, you know, make sure that communication is, is, is um, disseminated across all of us. So I think it does depend on the situation or the context. Okay, thank you for answering. So right now, um, let's speak other question. This question from Abdurrahman Musa, and um, he asked us, we know that there is still COVID-19, what, what steps has the school is taken to help ensure the safety of students? And this question goes to the Mr. Uh, Dr. Yusuf. Okay, I think the, the, the general context is focused on education in Africa and that's the way I understand even the question in a sense, it could be in that direction. But in the UK and in the diaspora and also Hamdi can contribute, you know, her understanding, but you know, teachers are not now safeguarding anymore, uh, you know, students. Students are at home most of the time. So the, the question should be, uh, what are the safeguards, you know, safeguarding Somali parents are using you know, for, for their children and students at home. Oh, they, you know, they, they, they keep their safeties and all this stuff. Uh, so I, I think there is a good communication between, you know, the parents and teachers as well. Parents are trying to make sure that students are in the best condition, you know, security-wise, educational-wise, safety-wise, and all this stuff. We have a daughter of six years old and uh, you know, teachers came to our house more than three times just to make sure the you know, educational environment in you know, as well. We are both also PhD holders, myself and my wife, we were really well prepared, but so I think that kind of, uh, you know, environment is prevailing in the, the diaspora, but I don't know, really back home in Africa, I can't say anything. I think if I can come uh, uh, over on that, uh, the question uh, coming from uh, 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 from the social media is uh, also focusing in Somaliland because of uh, just the announcement of yesterday saying yes. that the school is coming back. Uh, and the reason of the question I imagine is that what has been done so far since we are going back to the schools. I think little has been done because of the communication yes. until two days ago, it. but completely. But I think, stop it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Until until a few days back, it was absolutely in a total uncertainty whether the schools will reopen or not. So the, to, to the best question, uh, to the answer, is uh, that nothing has been done so far. Yesterday, we got the information that they will open. We will see next uh, week what will happen. Still, we have some time. And luckily, the fact that the schools are closed for some holidays is giving us some time to prepare something. And in my view, for sure, the uh, a hygiene system, sanitation system will improve. That's something of the lessons learned uh, that we have to deal with. And, and, and it became natural that we are not hugging each other. We are not uh, handshaking each other. So the life really changed and affected uh, so much. So I think the schools will be equally equipped. Uh, and then uh, at least we'll be having a, you know, a, 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 um, um, uh, 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 the minimum uh, requirement uh, of the uh, sanitation and, and, and health. When are you back? I was assisting you while you were away. Can I just very quickly add some yes. add something to that? Um, I was just thinking yeah, this will be a great opportunity for teachers to take learning outside of the classroom, um, especially with the measures around COVID nineteen around the, you know I think class teaching outside the classroom would be an amazing idea. And then the alternative will be to use locally resourced kind of, we, we can make our own hygiene, um, you know, soaps, you know, um, we can be quite creative in how we become more, um, I guess, uh, you know, safe around hygiene, I, I think. Um, and then we can implement it into our daily life. I mean, we, I mean, most people in Somalia pray 
and they they do will do and through that you know i would say they're far more hygienic than in other communities where you know that there, there isn't that practice of will do so i think we need to incorporate that into we need to merge that into a, a daily living and instead of um kind of um, using a very prescriptive approach that is um adopted from other countries yeah can i add Mona, just one point uh related to the yeah you know, yeah yeah welcome you know the safety in, you know in, in the diaspora or here in the uk actually what they do is they they, they ask it you know student to bring their own food rather than uh, you know in the past in some areas in in, in the london schools should actually provide you know, the food but now they actually stopped avoiding uh, any kind of of covid 19 communication or that kind of you know uh, related and social distancing also is taking place in the in the in the in the, in the class as well in the five i know in the primary school at least in my local area i don't know the high school level but they they put every five you know students in one class and each student you know it's a separate they are not allowed actually to you know touch with each other so it's quite a very 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 funny and plus they 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 actually ask each child you know to to come uh, to the school every morning with a new clothes not the yesterday one so they, they, they're just avoiding any kind of you know, virus you know uh, related you know stuff so that's what's happening here in london would you permit me to say something on this point please sorry in which area sorry yes this on this matter of schools uh, resuming in somaliland Ajama, I think he's a youth Somaliland. No, I, I'm not asking. I want to say something. You would uh, like to add something? Uh, I would, yes, general. I wanted to say. Yes. First okay, of well, all, you can, but... yes. Mm -hmm. First of all, I don't know the, what the weather is like in, in Somaliland uh, because here in Nigeria, it is the onset of the rainy season which means that with our very crowded uh, classes and insufficient classrooms, we can't uh, ensure physical distancing for our children in school. And we can't use the open space outside because it's, you can't know when it will be raining. Uh, besides, the way we, we learn in Africa, our children run around is not like in Europe where everybody is so uh, controlled. So how do we realistically avoid children interacting, which is the, 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 their biggest motivation for going to school, to be with their friends and interact? Those are questions that we must ask ourselves if we are not going to uh, hastily return to school and multiply the, uh, the infection rate. Thank you. Have you done? Your... Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm through. Yeah, thank you so much. And right now I will read because time is running. So I will try to read two um, questions at one time, then I will pass to you. And the first question is the challenge. The challenge are money, but the solution the solutions are not as easy as we think. Practically, this is time some be quite difficult. But I think if we precise, we can we can some assume the problem is. I think this question is basic about uh, it is solution is not easy, but think is as difficult. So how can we overcome for that challenge right now? So this question I would like to ask on, on Hamda Mohammed. So welcome, Hamda. Thank you. I think it's a very good question. I mean, I think before any solution, we need to do a very thorough problem analysis, right? Um, so I think that's what, at the stage that we're at now. We need to, I think, a, a, you know, wide range of actors have this discussion openly on a platform or. You know, or we share we share these problems that we've identified, and we do a thorough problem analysis, and that that has to include the locals. It has to include the communities affected by um, some of the problems that we are unpacking. 
but I, I, I think for me is, is, is to understand that we, as, especially in Somaliland, that everyone has to take a, a more active um, you know, role in, in what's happening in our society. For example, I think waste management is a major issue in Somaliland. We can't have this issue about controlling a virus if you look around what's happening you know, with the, how waste is managed in Somaliland, the two good things go hand in hand, right? Um, so I think we need to have, be more um, cautious about in our environment, but more importantly, be more active citizens. I think some of us education and learning has become disconnected from, um, you know, our role in society. Um, I mean, the whole point of learning the human capital is to contribute, not just economy, you know, in terms of economic or kind of development, but social development and environmental development. And I think environmental development is an area that we have to focus on, because I think it really interconnects with education, with the health, with the social policies. There's so many things I think we need to, but I think we need to come back down to the environment to analyze some of the issues that really, I think, stem from how we treat our a landscape, an amazing landscape that we have in some island. Yeah, that's my contribution. Thank you, Hamza. Thank you, Hamza. Thank you so much, Hamza. And this question will be, I think, the last question. And Sabah asked us, Sabah Ahmed, and she said, what is the best advice you would be the, give the parents who don't have that much education to help their children at home? This is a hard time. So this question goes to uh, Dr. Chama. Hello, Dr. Chama, are you there? Uh, yes, uh, I'm here. I think it's a, yeah. a really big question. Uh, big and, uh, and, and, I think, and I think it's not easy to answer. Um, uh, all what we were discussing about was to mention uh, the problems that we are facing. I completely agree uh, with with Hamda that uh, this is a, a great opportunity to uh, to do a research, a proper research. When, when you have challenges, you learn from it, but you learn from it analyzing the problem and understanding. So um, the, the parents, I know they will do everything possible for their children in their capacity. That has been always, and it will be so. So nothing new coming from that perspective. The parents will do their best their capacity for what we would do other. The problem is here, we are moving to next stage, which is uh, the technology is becoming a huge part of our, our, our life and the solutions. So I think there should be a common uh, collective responsibility for the people who are not able to help uh, their uh, uh, children, despite they would do everything for, for it. So I think more than what to ask the parents is that I'm sure they, uh, they, uh, they know better than me what they have to do for their children. And I know that they will do that. Uh, but when there is a limitation, and they are hitting the ceiling, as they, they used to say, it's the collective responsibility from, the, from us, uh, from the governments uh, that have to come up uh, with solutions. And the solutions will come when we, when we study the problem. I think it's uh, as Yusuf was hinted, as Yusuf was hinting, hinting at the, the, uh, in his discussion, uh, I think it's a great moment for educationists to sit down back, uh, localize the solutions that uh, we have to offer to our people without copying and making cut and paste from the uh, ready-made solutions from the West that will never help uh, and will never sort out the problem of the global South. So it's a, it's a, it's a great, great opportunity now to, 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 to do a research, a proper research, uh, and to work. I see that Professor Mario is asking uh, 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 the question of the pastoralists if they are ready. I think it's a great question, but that's really something that needs an entire discussion because of 60% uh, of the population in Somaliland that come from the nomadic. And it is uh, the responsibility of each of us to, 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 to dedicate a bit of our thinking and doing, and, and, and doing research. Uh, uh, I'm sorry that the time really ran out, but I see that great question. I see that Hussein uh, or Sami who is asking really great question. But uh, I know, Mona, that uh, you are, we are in your hands. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Chama. And as you said, yes, the time is running out. So I would like to give every person the to, to final statement and then and I will offer to her seat. So welcome everyone. And let me first
first the Hamda, then Dr. Yusuf, then Dr. Jerome. So welcome, Hamza. Thank you. I think um, today's conversation will be one of many conversations, and it, it's it's the starting point. And I congratulate um, the Gaysa Culture Centre for always being the catalyst for starting such conversations, really. Um, but I think in order to move forward, we do really, it has to be a very, it has to be situated within the context. It has to be a localized and contextualized approach. You know, an approach that would work in some, in Hargeisa is not going to work in certain other parts of some island. So we have to really look at, at things from a, and I think um, I really want to really uh, emphasize that education is not just the classroom based learning that we do, we need to also, you know, acknowledge the, the non-cognitive learning that we've done in this process. Um, I mean, I've learned some Somali tradition that I wasn't aware of. I, you know, there's so many things, uh, books I've moved, books I've read, and that may not be the case with most people, but I think there are other forms of learning taking place uh, that we need to also build on. So, thank you. Welcome, Hamda. Welcome, Dr. Yusuf, Sheikh. Okay, thank you very much. It was really a process of learning for, for me and, and I thank you for everyone as well. And I appreciate uh, Red Sea Cultural Foundation for this great initiative. And I would urge you just to continue as well. It's a timely, very important topic. So just only what I'm saying is waiting for the, the second meeting, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf. And welcome, Dr. Chiroma. Thank you very much. Sorry I if I to... mispronounce your name. Don't worry. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions that was raised that I want to make a, a very swift comment is what could be a continental collaborative framework to assure education, education's role in Africa? I, I think that has been a big question because uh, Africa has often been accused by the West of only being consumers of knowledge, but not producers or creators thereof. Uh, I am aware of the OER Africa initiative, which is encouraging uh, locally produced knowledge uh, and knowledge sharing by means of open educational resources. So I think that uh, this is one one way, there are many other ways, but this is one way that we can begin to synergize and begin to build capacity as Africans together because this capacity is it dispersed, it's all over the place. And we're always looking to the West to validate what we are doing. We should look to Africa to validate what Africans are doing for Africa in the context of Africa. And OER Africa is one way that we can do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Nasir, can you hear me? Are you around? I'm not sure. Uh, okay. And lastly, Dr. Njama. Uh, um, thank you so much, uh, Mona. It's mm -hmm. really great pleasure to have all of you. It was uh, it was uh, a learning process, as the piece was saying. Um, we will continue in this in this direction. Uh, I think the important point that has been raised was the issue of uh, how uh, uh, what, what was mentioned in Dr. Jerome now, which was uh, how we can work together in the African context. I think we have to uh, go back uh, to our, uh, uh, as, as uh, Hamdo was saying, to localize the situation and come up with the creative solutions. And if, uh, uh, as I said, uh, there is kind of uh, the direction that uh, uh, you know, uh, state oriented things are coming up and overtaking because of the of the problem, but it should be a lesson learned for us, to, and, and and at least in a regional level, if not at continental level, we have to see what we can contribute to each other. And I think good, good already good uh, suggestions are coming up with the what we have. This is a crisis, and the crisis don't give you options, but it forces to you to be creative with what you have and to come up with the solution. And I think we are in a good in a, in a good position. Just we need now to capitalize uh, of the emergencies. We don't need to sit back uh, now again and restart uh, the waiting coming uh, from outside, helping us uh, 
but uh, with being creative what we have uh, and come up with the solution be with the with the with the capacity that we have uh, and of course it's about the time that the uh, the government theory take their own responsibility on social efforts we don't have i know that we don't have money to put in circulation to change but we have to come up with creative solutions uh, with what the capacity that we have Thank you so much, Toro Jama. Uh, now we are finishing the session. Before and we finish, I will hand over to Tersit. So welcome, Tersit, for conclusion. Thank you very much, Mona, for an excellent moderation. And I, I cannot even express how grateful I am to all the <coughs> excellent panelists who have touched up on all the issues that we wanted to be covered for this session. I mean, a lot of questions coming from uh, the social media, from Facebook, through the Zoom, and I'm sorry, we, we were not able to have enough time to address those all questions, but I, I have seen how enlightening, how informative and engaging it is, and this, all, this is all because of the contribution from all the panelists, the same people involved in all aspects. So I want to say thank you very much for everyone. And uh, definitely uh, the issues of like in, uh, contextualizing, regional cooperation are in our upcoming events and social inclusivity specifically. More specifically next week, our episode is gonna be on social inclusivity and uh, how that is visible into the COVID management by looking into the gaps. So I think all episodes are building into each other. So thank you very much once again for everyone and have a blessed evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you for Bye. 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 Bye